With a voice of thanksgiving, we praise you, O God, for all that you are, for all that you've created. Your works are great. You forgive our sins, heal our wounds, you redeem our lives. So compassionate, full of power and grace, through joy and sorrow, you are always there. So let us show our thanks with our sacrifice. Let us sing of your goodness, delight in your love. We give thanks to the Lord. Well, in four short days, we will celebrate one of, I believe, the best holidays of all, Thanksgiving. It's a time to be grateful. And it's not about presents. It's not about stringing lights. It's not about um, music. There's no Grinches or elves. There's no reindeer. I mean, when you think about Thanksgiving, um, it's eating really good food and hanging out with your family and friends. What could possibly be better than that? It's amazing. And and so we get the opportunity this week to, to do that. You know, my mom always had a full house and a full table at Thanksgiving. And it wasn't just her kids and her grandkids. My mom was a co-owner of a florist shop for a while here in Gulf Breeze. And uh, we would come over for Thanksgiving as adults even. And there'd be some people there. I'd go to my brother and my sister like, who's that? They go, I don't know. And we didn't know who it was. And it was someone that had been to the shop and maybe they had a, no family around or something. And my mom and my stepdad invite them over for Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving was, was always filled with um, just great memories. This, this week, we have our, our daughters in town. Of course, we have two sons who live here. And if you count them all up, we have 13 grandkids. So they're all going to be at our house. So we're just going to take the rest of the service and pray for, <laughs> for Lynn and I. So our house will be torn down. Um, it's going to be chaos, but it's going to be, be a lot of fun. And um, we're, we're grateful. Len and I are very grateful and thankful for God's hand of blessing on our lives and for the family he's given us and the children and want to take a time during this season to remember uh, how grateful we are for just the things that God has blessed us with. And I hope you'll do the same. But let's bow our heads right now and pray before we get into the scripture, before we get into the Bible. Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together in your name. Help us to never, ever, and ever, ever take that for granted. To be able to come together freely and sing and worship and open the scriptures and allow the truth to to come pouring forth into our hearts and lives, how it changes us and challenges us and instructs us and sometimes corrects us. And so, Lord, do all that today, I pray, through your word. We know it's alive and it's active and it's able to accomplish the reason and purpose for which you send it into our lives. So, Lord, may our hearts be wide open and may you, Lord, speak as you always do your truth to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe Psalm 103 is actually a psalm of thanksgiving. And it begins, and I'm just going to start by By reading the first two verses, it begins like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Bless the Lord. The psalm begins that way, and if you look to the very last verse, verse 22, it ends that way. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Some commentators and scholars said not only that, but it has the exact same amount of verses as the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And they say this is a psalm that was written by David to be a psalm of completeness, a psalm of blessing, of fullness. 
Or maybe you could picture it like this. It's a wholehearted response of David's to a gracious, holy God who blesses us. And so David turns it around and says, bless the Lord, O my soul. The, the word bless is, is the Hebrew word B-A-W-R-A-K, ball rack. And what it means really in the Hebrew is to bow the knee, to bow your knee to, to the sovereign one above you. And in David's case, obviously, to recognize and bow the knee to the majesty and the power of his God. So here's what he says. Here's how he starts. David says, bow the knee, bless the Lord, O my soul. And he says, and all, all that's within me. David is, is whatever his current situation is, whatever his circumstance, whatever he's caught up in at this point in his life, he has this wonderful moment right here where he stops and worships and praises and bow the knee to God and says, bless you, Lord, with my soul and all that is within me. And he's not telling the reader to do this. He's not telling the nation to do this. He's not telling the servants of his and his kingdom. At this point, David is speaking to himself. And he's saying to himself, O oh, my soul, bless the Lord. And in those first five verses, David speaks directly to himself, directly to his own heart, his own soul, and everything that's in him. And then as he leaves those first five verses and goes on to, to verse 6, he begins to speak to the nation. He begins to, to call them to, to recognize what the Lord has done for them. He, he speaks to them about God's goodness, that they should praise the Lord for His kindness, His mercy, His protection. And then he does something that's interesting. I never recognized this before, but as I was reading through this psalm, there at the end of it, in verse 19 through 22, he speaks to all the universe, to the angels, to those who serve in the courts of heaven. Look, look what he says. He says, the Lord has established, verse 19, his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding his voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, and he ends it again with that refrain, O oh, my soul. Powerful psalm. Spurgeon, the one known as the Prince of Preachers, says this about the very first five verses. Those first five verses where, where David takes some time and he tells us some, well, some benefits of the Lord that he's grateful for, that he's thankful for. Spurgeon says it like this. He says, David selects a few choice pearls from the treasured chest of God's amazing mercy and love, and he threads them on the necklace of memory and hangs them on the neck of gratitude. And he begins to reveal to us, David, the benefits that he believes God has given him and why he should bless the Lord with all that is within him. These are the words, listen, these are the words of a grateful man. These are the words of a thankful man. Even though he's been scarred by all kinds of things in his life, and David had, scarred by his own sin, by his own family, David, who had experienced a lot of hurt, a lot of anguish, a lot of pain, and I'm sure rejection. There were probably times when David, and maybe you felt this way, would love to have just run away from everything and everybody. Ever feel that way? David did. And yet he says, 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. David knew extreme victories. He knew great defeats, both physically and emotionally. So now here he is. I don't know his circumstances. I don't know what he's going through at this time. But this powerful warrior, and he was, this amazing poet, was certainly that, a gifted musician, either sitting, and I, I kind of like to visualize him bending on his knees with some kind of writing instrument in his hand. There before his God, he begins to string these pearls on this necklace of gratitude, and he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And as we're stepping out of Philippians, I want you to Think about this. We talked about Jesus, the, the key to joy. Joy doesn't make you grateful. Gratitude makes you joyful. Joy always follows gratitude. And as we celebrate this time of Thanksgiving, I, I, would, I would challenge you, I would encourage you, I would remind you to take some time. Examine, analyze, reflect, maybe even write down the things your soul can bless the Lord for. Those things in your life, your, 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 those things in your family, those, those things in your heart. Listen to what David says. Here's what he's grateful for. Here's what he's thankful for. Here's what he bows the knee to his sovereign king for. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, verse 2. And then he begins to list them, the benefits. He lists five of them. Number one, he says, who forgives all your iniquities. The God of my soul, he says, has forgiven all my sins, forgiven all yours. This is a powerful thing. Forgiveness is the first and maybe the most amazing gift that God has given to you and I in our lives. That's where relationship starts with Him. That's the doorway into His presence, forgiveness. So very first of all, David reminds himself and blesses the Lord for it. Think back in your own life. Don't go too far because we don't have that much time. Of all the things that God has forgiven you of. I mean, maybe you can even just go as far as the parking lot till you got to this chair. All that God has forgiven you of. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities. Look at verse 10. He kind of mentions this in, in, in a sense right here. He says, he has not dealt with us, in Psalm 103, verse 10, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. And so David thinks, He's forgiven all my sins. He's removed them as far as the east is from the west. And he starts off with that kind of heart, with that kind of remembering how God has forgiven him. I mean, it's like that great hymn. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. I, I have a hymnal here with me, and it's one that was given to me when I graduated from seminary. They gave us all a Baptist hymnal. And sometimes I'll just read hymns. Hymns are great. And this one was written by a man, and I'm sure you've perhaps heard the story before, a, a man by the name of uh, Horatio Spafford. He lived in the 1800s. He was an attorney. He was a, a real estate investor, and him and his wife had just experienced the death of their four-year-old son. He had scarlet fever. He passed away. They were living in Chicago. And so he and his, the rest of his family, he had four girls, 
he had a wife, and so he said, we're going we're gonna to leave, we're going to get away, we just need some time to kind of recover, to heal. So they were going to go to England, and he had some business to settle before he went, so he sent his wife and his daughters, uh, put them on a ship and sent them over to England, and he was to come in a couple of days. Well, the ship that his family was on was involved in a horrible collision in the Atlantic Ocean with another ship, and all 200, there were 200 people on the ship that died, and four of them were his daughters. And when his wife got to England, when she finally was able to respond, she sent a telegram, and this is what it, all it said, saved alone, what shall I do? He said, I will be there soon. He, he boarded a ship, headed for England, and the captain of that ship knew the story, knew what had happened to him. And when they were passing that very place where the ship had collided and his daughters had gone down, he called him to the deck and he said, this is the place, this is the, the very spot where the accident occurred. And Horatio went down into his cabin and he wrote this hymn. I'm just going to read two verses from it. He said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then he pins this as one of the verses, and I think perhaps he was even thinking about Psalm 103. He said, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. O oh, my soul. Not just a part of my sin, but all of it. David says who, says who forgives all your iniquities. And God, God forgives you of all your sins. And David recognizes how grateful he should be for that. It's like in, in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17, we have this, this verse that says, Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit, the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. In other words, you don't remember them anymore. David gives us this great example of gratitude and thanksgiving. And then he goes on and he lists a second one. He says, not only does he forgive all your iniquities, but he heals all your diseases. Now, it'd be real easy to kind of skip over that verse really quick because I've been in too many hospital rooms and officiated too many funerals to know that God doesn't always heal everyone's diseases. I know He heals. I know He's gracious. I know He's kind. I know He's merciful. But I don't ever go into a hospital room to pray for someone and promise that, well, God will heal you if you have enough faith or if I have enough faith. But God does heal. I, I, I don't teach prosperity that everyone should be rich. I, I, I'm not opposed to being rich. But I don't think the Bible promises that everyone will be healthy all the time or wealthy all the time. God's sovereign. But He does heal. And, and I think what might be being said here when, when David is talking about my soul and all that is within me and my sins are forgiven and he heals all your diseases. If you look down at verse 6, he also says, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for those who are oppressed. And I want you to listen. I want you to tune in for just a second. Some of the diseases that he heals, I mean, well, are diseases of your soul. Pride is one of them that God wants to heal. Another one might be bitterness that, that creeps into a heart, into a life, and, and believe me, it's a disease that can destroy you. Lust is a disease. 
that spirals out of control and creates nightmares in people's lives and marriages. Someone paralyzed by apathy or laziness, hurt, anger, rejection. God can heal those things. He can heal those things in your life. I mean, think about, you ever thought about Job? I mean, think about that story. Job, who, who lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his servants. He lost his home. He lost his income. Job lost everything. I mean, the book, if you read it, is filled with questions. Job questioning God. Job doubting God. Job, 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 Job you know, just arguing with God. I would probably do the same thing, and so would you, if you lost all your children and all your servants and all your, well, I don't have any servants. But if you lost everything in one day, if you buried your children, all of them in one day, and Job began to question, he has no ability to produce income. He sits in sackcloth and ashes and scrapes sores on his body, and, and, and he struggles Job struggles for some time, all the way to, to, to ver chapter 23, he's struggling and questioning. And right about chapter 23, Job begins to find some daylight. He begins to find some healing. Listen to what he says. He knows the way that I take, speaking of God. He, he knows me. And when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot is held fast to his steps. I've kept his way. I've not turned aside. I've not departed from the commandment of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job says, I'm starting to see a little daylight. I'm starting to find healing. And God gives healing. begins to come into the soul and the life of Job, who could have been filled with bitterness for the rest of his life. I mean, his wife seemed pretty bitter. She came to him and just said, Job, here's what you should do. Curse God and die. And, I, and I'm careful about mocking Job's wife, because she too had lost her children, her servants. She also lost everything. And, you know, I, if, if I've learned anything after 44 years of marriage... I haven't learned that much, <laughs> but I have learned this. People respond differently to things. Some things happen, my wife responds one way, I respond another. You ever experienced that? Some things that drive me crazy don't bother her at all. Some things that drive her crazy, I say no big deal. Here's Job and his wife trying to deal with life in the midst of amazing hurt and pain. Because we're not all put together the same way. L listen, when, when you celebrate Thanksgiving, number one, be grateful for the fact that He has forgiven you all your sins. And be grateful for the fact that He heals your life. Now, you maybe heard me tell this story before, but when I was 13 years old, my mom divorced my father. It was a huge thing in our family. There was five children. I was the middle child. I mean, I was like, like right in the middle. I had older brother, older sister, younger sister, younger brother. I couldn't have been more middle. But my dad was abusive. He would hit me. He would hit my older brother. He would hit my mom. And then when I got to be 13, my, my older brother was probably 16. My mom decided enough was enough, and she even told us, I asked her, why did you divorce dad? Because even with abusive as he was, it was, it was a gap. She goes, well, I knew he was either going to kill you boys or you were going to kill him. We were starting to get a little muscle on us, and we weren't going to put up with it anymore. 
Five years, six years later, I, I get saved. A couple years after that, I'm in Bible college, and I'm walking around the campus, and, and I'm in this little Christian bubble now of a, a Bible college. I didn't know that much about the Bible, but I did know this. Most of these guys that I was starting to meet and hang out with, their dads were elders or pastors or deacons. They had all these great stories of growing up in the church and stuff, and I thought, wow, I, I didn't do that. And I was kind of bitter. I was like, God, why didn't you give me a dad? Like, he, he never took me fishing, or he never you know, did this, or never said I loved you. Or, God, why didn't you give me a dad like that? And the Lord kind of healed me. He spoke to me in some way and said, John, your dad is not the enemy. He was a victim of the enemy. And you would be just like him if I had not saved you. And it was like from that point on, I thought, boy, that's for sure. I would have been just like him, but God, you, you saved me, and now you're healing me, and you've forgiven me of all my iniquities. And David doesn't end there as he lifts the benefits of what he blesses the Lord with his soul for. He says, you, you've forgiven me all my iniquities, you healed my diseases, and you redeemed my life from destruction, or the King James Version says, from the pit. Don't you love that word? Pit. You delivered me from the pit. And God does deliver. In, in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1, it says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were Doug, God takes us out of the old life. He takes us out of the pit. He delivers us from destruction. He redeems your life from the darkness that you are in and gives you a brand new way to walk and live from the pit of corruption. If you look there at Psalm 103, look at, look at verse 15. He kind of mentions this here. He says, as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it, it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children to as such as keep his covenant and those who remember his commandments to do them. God delivers. God gives life. Paul is grateful. I mean, David is grateful. He, he's thankful. And, and when, when Thanksgiving comes around, it's a great time to remember the pit that God pulled you out of. And it tells us here in verse 4 that he redeems your life from the pit and he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. You're not under some harsh God. You're not under some difficult judgment. You're not waiting for God to, to run out of patience. But He crowns you with grace, with mercy, with kindness. This Thanksgiving, remember His grace. Remember His kindness. I, I used to love to listen to Pastor Chuck Smith's sermons when he, the guy who started Calvary Chapels, and there would be stories he would tell about people who had wronged him and pastors who had, you know, left the church, his staff and stuff, and, and he would always say this. He goes, you know, and people say, well, why didn't you say this, or why didn't you do that? And Chuck would say, well, I'd rather err on the side of grace than judgment any day. And he wrote a book, you can get it on Amazon, that says it's titled Grace Changes Everything. And grace does in relationships, in your own life when the Lord pours it out on you. See, the world is filled with rules and law and, you know, all kinds of stuff. You got to go this speed limit. Got to have this document. Got to get this shot. You got to do this or whatever it might be. But God gives grace. It gives mercy. And so we are to be grateful and graceful. And to thank God for His mercy, listen, that's new every morning. 
Listen to what he says. This is Psalm 103, a, a, great, a great remembrance, a great, I believe, instruction on what it means to be grateful and how to be thankful and to bless his holy name. Verse 5, he says, he satisfies your mouth with good things. Now, that's a Thanksgiving verse right there. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, when, when I, uh, my wife and I, uh, after prayer and a lot of counsel, decided to start a church, which, which we had no idea what we were really doing, I was 30 years old. My son, Neil, was two years old, and Lynn was going to be having another child before we actually got the first building up. And as the church began to grow, we built our first building. We were over in a different sanctuary, and I turned 40 years old 10 years later. And they threw me a surprise birthday party. I wasn't expecting it. Came up to the church one night. Lynn said she left something up here. And I walked in the sanctuary and it's filled with people. Surprise! I was 40. And I felt so old. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm 40 years old. Life is over. They, they, they came and got me. I was in the back. They put me in a wheelchair. <laughs> they threw a blanket over my legs. They rolled me up to the platform. A guy had on a plastic glove and some Vaseline. I said, what is this for? He goes, time for that, that test. I went, what? So that didn't happen. And, <laughs> but it was like, I, I'm old. I'm 40. They, they, you know, a bunch of people chipped in. They had bought me a new surfboard. And they, people had, you know, poems and stuff they read about being old. And they gave me all these old people gifts and stuff. And, and, and now I, I look back on that, and I'm, I'm 68. And I read this verse. And it says, he satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And so at 68, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've got, my kids are grown. I've got all these grandkids, and Lynn and I are trying to figure out life at this stage. And, and at the same time, though, sometimes we'll be talking, and I'll go, I don't feel that old. There's still a lot of satisfaction, and, and I was in the hospital this week praying for a guy that I've known for a long time. He was in an accident, and, and different things that we get to do as, as being part of the ministry here. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of vision, and I think in some ways, I, I say, you know, I don't, I don't feel much different than I did when I was 30. I think part of it is, is realizing that, that, you know, the Lord's in my life and he gives, he gives new vision, he gives new energy, and, and finding myself sometimes saying, you know, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. When, when you're grateful, when you're thankful, when you're trying to live out life that way, in some ways I think the Lord just renews your strength. It's an amazing thing. I think gratitude has something to do with the way you live. Here's what I think. You don't want to be a grumpy old man or woman. Amen? Amen. <laughs> See, I remember when my daughter was growing up, Jenny, she loved the Bible. She loved coming to church and studying the Bible. We used to call her Bible Jenny. And, and her older brother went off to Bible college and graduated. And she said, Dad, I want to go to Bible college when I finish high school. I said, ah, well, okay. So she went off to Calvary Chapel Bible College in Temecula. And Lynn and I went to her graduation. And I'll never forget, we were there. And Pastor Chuck Smith was there. All these kind of big wig Calvary pastors. And, and they had a musician there who was going to sing. Well, a vocalist, really. And... It kind of surprised me because they were going through the ceremony and then they had this special music and the soloist or the singer was, and maybe you'll recognize this name, a lady by the name of Johnny Erickson Tada. Maybe you know Johnny's story. Johnny's a quadriplegic. At 17 years of age, she, she dove off of a, a, a dock in Baltimore where she grew up. And from that day forward, she was paralyzed from the neck down. But an amazing Christian with a spirit that doesn't grow old. 
And she began, she learned how to, to do art with her mouth and, a, and a, you know, an instrument. She became a singer. She became, became an advocate for those who were handicapped. And so there, she, there was Johnny sitting in her, in her wheelchair, you know, and she was going to sing. And, and the song she sang was, It Is Well With My Soul. And as she began to sing it, she says, you're going to have to help me because I'm in this wheelchair. And at that time, she was 52 years old. And she says, my diaphragm doesn't work like it used to since I've been in this chair this long and I can't stand. And she began to sing. And I thought to myself, wow, if anyone could be grouchy or grumpy or discontent, are ungrateful. She's 72 years old now and been in the wheelchair since 17. Still loving the Lord, still serving the Lord. She's not a bitter old grouch. She ministers, she sings, she does arts. And, and here's, here's kind of the, the point of this story. Someday, if you're not there already, you'll be old. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, don't allow yourself to become an old, grumpy, grouchy, ungrateful person. Like David, be able to say, bless the Lord, O my soul. I bend my knee to my sovereign. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And everything that is within me, and I'm not going to forget any of his benefits, especially the number one on the list that he has forgiven all my iniquities, that he's healed me, that he's redeemed my life from that pit. I remember that pit. Do you remember the pit? That he has crowned me with loving kindness and mercy. He's not out to get me. That's what I, I love to tell people when I'm involved in baptism. The Lord loves you. He's not out to get you. He doesn't hate you. He's pleased with what you're doing today. He's crowned me with loving kindness and mercy, satisfies your mouth with good things so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. So, so on Thanksgiving, after the turkey, after the dressing, after the cranberry or the pie, whatever it is, don't, don't forget this. Don't, don't ever forget, forget this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction or the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There's a great verse in the book of Hebrews. It's in Hebrews chapter 13, I believe, and it talks about, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, and giving thanks to his name. And listen, and do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Offer thanksgiving with the sacrifice of your lips and remember. See, God gave you lips, not just to eat, but to give praise and to give thanks. That's why you have lips, to give a sacrifice of praise, to bow the knee and bless the Lord with your lips and to remember all that he, that's why you have a memory, to remember all that he has done for you. And somehow, in some way, in the midst of swirling life, David finds himself on his knee and saying, there's some benefits, God, that you and only you could have brought into my life, and I need to be grateful. I need to bless your holy name. And all that is within me, bless you. And you know what? So do I. 
and so do you. Amen? Let's stand together. Lord, I thank you for all the blessings in my life. There's more than I really deserve. And Lord, based on your faithfulness, there's more to come. And I thank you for the privilege of gathering together with your people to honor you, to worship you, to love you. And Lord, to take the lips that you have given us and just sing sacrifices of praise. We don't bring oxen or goats or any kind of sacrifices like that, Lord. But our lips today, we sacrifice praise to you. It's a gift. May our lips be clean and may they be holy. And may you, Lord, receive from us today honor and praise. Bless you, Lord. We bow our knee before you. Bless your holy name. Let's worship him.